And again, I'm Tiffany Gunter, the uh, Chief of Operations for the Regional Transit Authority, and I just appreciate your willingness to come out and listen to what the RTA is working on and offer your support. I know a lot of the faces in this room, and I know that you've been in this for quite some time, that you've been supportive for quite some time, despite what's happened in the region with regard to transportation and the disappointments that we've all uh, endured together. So. Um, given that, applause uh, to you for your continued uh, participation and moving forward despite any circumstances that looked like they were not going to allow us to move forward. Um, so tonight I've been asked to talk a bit about what the RTA is doing and let me give a little back background about what the RTA is. I was told not to assume in the room that you all knew this stuff, but I'm looking around at many of these faces and I think that I'm going to have some people going, come on. <laughs> so to give you a brief, a quick summary and if you want to do more in the Q&A, feel free. Um, the RTA was created legislatively in 2012, December of 2012, um, and the RTA was given um, specific charge to do certain things, and those things are, in a nutshell, coordinate existing services. Let me back up before I get into the charges. How is the, what's, how is the RTA comprised? The RTA is comprised of the four-county region, including Wayne, Oakland, Macomb, and Washtenaw, including the city of Detroit. Um, it is governed by a 10-member board. We have two members from each county that are appointed by the, either the county execs of Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb, or the chair of the Board of Commissioners for Washtenaw County. And we have another member, uh, additional members um, from the city of Detroit, one is, who was appointed by uh, Mayor, Mayor Duggan, and a non-voting chair who was appointed by the governor. And so that is our 10-member board, and that is our governing body that guides our policy and sets our direction for the future. So um, in addition to that, we do have jurisdiction over the existing transit agencies that operate within the region. That's SMART, AAATA, DDOT, and the People Mover. We do work in partnership with, with, the, with the M1 Rail Group, and I think it's no secret that after several years of operations, they do plan to hand over the M1 Rail um, services to the RTA to run those services in the future. So just in terms of how we're comprised and what our jurisdiction is, that's it in a, in a nutshell. What we're charged with doing is coordinating the existing services that exist that are on the street today. Um, we work with what's called a provider, provider's advisory committee on a very regular basis. We meet monthly um, in an open meeting setting to talk about with, where we are with regard to coordination and how we're moving forward. We've been working on quite a few things with regard to looking towards a unified fare study um, so that there's only one fare that you use on any of the systems and we're, we're getting closer and closer. I see some smiles. We're getting closer and closer. To the, uh, I like this. You guys are great. Um, and we're also looking at um, potential airport service from oh my God. the city of all the time. Praise God, hallelujah. Church. And tell what we're missing. We can tell what we're listening. And we're looking at what Michael Ford likes to refer to as the low-hanging fruit. What are the things that we can look at doing now? And we're also looking at, you know, just in general, coordinating the services of the existing SMART and DDAT system. The one thing that I do have to temper those statements with is that all of those things require money and investment. And so while we're looking at them and while we're studying them, we're trying to get ourselves multiple steps closer, way closer than we've ever been before with regard to implementation, and look at what we can do in the short term to make them happen before we're able to go out to a ballot initiative and have the funding necessary to support the full-on implementation of those things. Um, we have sought after some grant funding for airport service, and we are releasing an RFP probably at the end of this week, and um, we'll be getting cost estimates back from potential providers of that service and looking at when we can implement that, so you'll hear from us more about a timeline on those services very soon. Um, that's charge one. Took a while. <laughs> Charge number two is the planning process for our larger initiatives to build the true infrastructure that is required to have a, a, a truly connected network. And so, of that, we have what's called best projects. And I don't know if you had an opportunity to walk in the back of the room and look at sort of the, the boards that are back there, but best stands for building equitable, sustainable transit. And so what we hope to accomplish in doing that is that we have a hierarchy of projects. And just so you have a little frame of reference and context to the speed demon approach that Megan uh, <laughs> referenced uh, jokingly, is that we got staff in place in October. Michael Ford started in October, I started in October, and we brought the rest of the staff on. Since that time, we've been able to let contracts for all of our projects. So a regional master plan that's the guiding principle document for how the 
transit system will work throughout the entire region, as well as individual corridor studies for Gratiot Avenue and for Michigan Avenue. And Gratiot is going from downtown Detroit out to Mount Clemens and Michigan Avenue from Detroit to Ann Arbor. And so we're looking at those two corridors in addition to which we know that Woodward has this wonderful M1 rail that's being built, but we also have a locally preferred alternative that exists on Woodward for an extension from downtown Detroit to Pontiac for bus rapid transit. And that locally preferred alternative exists today, and what we'd like to do is be able to move that forward into the environmental analysis space. And so we've been working with the Federal Transit Administration because they've set up some new regulations that are actually that actually work in our favor when you don't have any additional right-of-way so that you're able to do perhaps a lower level of analysis to get your project moving mm -hmm. forward faster. So we're just waiting for a determination from them currently on how we can move forward with our environmental analysis. So I'm going to break those down a little bit further, but I do want to get through the actual full charge of the legislation before I get there. So just put a pin in that for just a moment and I'll get back to it. Um, so those are the projects that we're working on. And the third thing and the big thing is that we're charged with finding a funding mechanism, a dedicated funding source to implement all of these projects and all of these, sort of these, these, these wonderful things that we want to do and that we get excited about in the region. Now, Megan can talk to you ad nauseum about voting. <laughs> I can educate, I cannot advocate. So you will not hear from me about that. No one call the law. All right. <laughs> um, so with that, those are those are that that's our charge. We have to coordinate services, we have to plan and get a vision that we all support in the region, and then we have to find a way to pay for it. So those are our three big biggies. And I like to talk about those because they're different. There's they're different. Um, we've done master plans. We didn't call them master plans, we call them just transit plans. And, and we do them every seven years. It's kind of, it's, it's a weird thing. We, do, we did one in 2001, the region adopted it fairly unanimously that went through SIMCOG. We did another one in 2008 through the Regional Transit Coordinating Council. The big four adopted it. But it was no hard to get in place. So one of the things that, in, in the process of doing all these plans, our, our, our former late and wonderful Marianne Mahaffey, former city council president, um, got together and said, you know, I'm getting tired of this. Um, <laughs> and we have to put together what's called a transit impediments committee or task force. I don't remember what it was specifically. And she pulled us together and she said, we can never turn, we can never move the needle on this. We can plan until we're put in the place. But what, what, what's next? After we're done planning, what's next? And so that group came up with the obvious answers. We knew kind of what, we, what, what, what the challenges were going in, but her goal was to figure out ways to overcome the obstacles, not just talk about them. We knew what they were. They were governance. They were planning. And they were funding. So the RTA legislation addresses all of those things that the Transit Impediments Committee agreed upon and looked for ways to overcome those obstacles. I don't know, five or six, seven, eight, I don't know how many years ago that was. It, it, it turns into a blur after a while. <laughs> and so with that, we had this great window of opportunity where we don't want to let it pass. We remember some of, I, I wasn't alive, but I know the research <laughs> on this, of losing $600 million in the region um, that was provided to us or offered to us by the Ford administration. And we couldn't agree. We couldn't agree on how to move forward. And so we lost that money. Everybody else built out. And right now we're looking at the result of that. We talk a lot about this, what happens if we do nothing piece. Michael Ford asked that question. He wants to know, what happens if we do nothing? We are living in our do nothing. Yes. That's true. That's it. And so we have to move this forward. We have to, everybody in this room, I hope you have strong arms. Now I'll get you some things you can curl with because we got to keep that window open. <laughs> until we get through it, all the way through to the finish line. And when I say finish line, I'm not just talking about get the money. Once we get the money, the finish line is when people can truly have access, can truly get from one county to another without this jurisdictional boundary that says you have to get off here and wait for somebody else to come and pick you up. Hallelujah. We, we're tired. Preach. Buy a different ticket. <laughs> Buy a different ticket. We don't want that anymore. We want to overcome that. We want to give people the opportunity to get to where they need to go without the hassle and the frustrations they have to experience today. So, that's where we are in terms of what our motivation is, what our mission is, what drives us. We are also a very small staff, we're a staff of five. And what we accomplish in a day is amazing. We work first, second, and third shift. We <laughs> are serious about our charge, we're serious about our mission, and we wanna make it happen. So what's going on right now? We have these projects. 
So I will give you these in a nutshell and then kind of talk about the timeline and how, timeline and how they all fit, to, fit together. Um, one of the things that we were really concerned about in going into letting all of these contracts at one time is that we didn't want the public to be confused about what it is we were trying to do. Um, so we like to speak about it in the hierarchy. And I usually get a whiteboard to do this kind of stuff, so I'm <laughs> lost. So I'm going to write on the air here. <laughs> so we have a master, like plan, master planning process that we start. That's the top of the hierarchy. And what does that mean? It sounds really lofty, right? Master plan. The master plan is essentially you look at a tiered level of transit services and what you need and how, you, how it will look over the next 20 years. So the first five years, what are you going to get? 10 years, what are you going to get? 15 years, what are you going to get? 20 years, what are you going to get? So we look at how we phase it in over time. And what are we looking at? We're looking at rapid transit as the highest level component because we need rapid transit services. So we talked about the corridors that we're already studying. Um, one of the ones is kind of like, yeah, we, we talk about it, we, we've got to move on to just a tad of M59. We haven't started in 59 in terms of the east-west connection. Um, and that's the last corridor that we will be studying this legislative, legislatively required for rapid transit in this particular phase. The second level of that is the fixed route and feeder route network. So the feeder, bu feeder bus system, it gets a bad rap, right, because of what we've experienced, but the feeder bus system is truly what makes transit work. You can have these lines, but if you live in the center of one of those lines, what, what does it matter to you if you can't get east-west and you can't make additional north-south connections? So we're going to start looking at those things and where we can break down that boundary and get people to their communities and where we can reallocate services to the communities with the existing DDOT system and the existing SMART system and connect out to Washington. How we do that in a meaningful way that we're using our resources responsibly and efficiently as possible. So that's what the second layer of the system is looking at. And the third layer is the specialized transportation services. Um, specialized transportation services don't get a whole lot of attention, but we're making a really concerted effort. We brought in an, an expert um, uh, that's done this around the nation of looking at how you get to a truly one call, one click center for specialized transportation services. Our seniors and our people with disabilities should not have to go through hoops to get a ride to a medical appointment and to the doctor's or to the, to the grocery stores, it just doesn't make sense. And so we're looking at how we take that from an individual operator responsibility and raise it to a regional responsibility where we have a one call, one click center that we can implement and people can call one number and get to where they need to go um, using specialized transportation services. So we got a lot to do <laughs> and we got a lot to show for it. So one of the lovely things I like to talk about you know, and I closed about the master plan is that this is typically an 18 month process. But as we were looking at this, we said, we've got two previous master plans, and they were <laughs> eerily similar. <laughs> and so this 18-month process really shouldn't take 18 months. I think we do have to go back, validate what we know, talk to people, make sure that they understand what it is we're trying to accomplish, and then we produce a plan that makes sense in this seven-year round of planning. And so we've switched an 18-month process into six months. And our project teams are outstanding. They accepted the challenge. They proposed it 18 months. We told them to go back and figure it out, and they did. <laughs> so we're moving forward, and we want to be done with this master plan by December of this year. We have a short window of time here. We've got to convince and explain to people what they, they're going to get by November. And so because of that, we have to be done with this plan. We've learned some lessons from what happened in May. Can't confuse you. We got to be clear. We got to be very specific about what we're going to offer in return for your investment in transit and your belief in our ability to do it. Um, so that's the top layer. And if we drill down into the other layers, we have what's called these. I still call them alternatives analysis. The Federal Transit Administration has gotten weird. They don't like titles anymore, but they are still alternatives analysis. <laughs> and what an alternative? How many people know what that is? Because you've been okay. All right, about half the room because. Standing in this room, I have a really vivid memory of being here talking about the Woodward um, <laughs> alternatives yep. analysis a few years back. And so what that is, is you go through a, a process that's federally mandated. And the reason why you go through this process, which I will explain in just a moment, is because the federal government likes to give you capital dollars. They um, don't and will not support your operating. They want you to prove locally that you can support something over a 20 to 25 year period if they're going to make an investment in you. So they have what's called a match program, which is new starts, small starts, or now even very small starts. 
We'll take any of them. <laughs> but that, those are the programs, and, it, and they say it's an 80-20 match. That's kind of the standard line they give you. It's more like a 40-60, how much money you got. That goes into the analysis of what who we fund. And so they have, the FDA has a lot of focus on the city of Detroit and the region around it right now. So they really want to help us. They want, want to be supportive of, of us, but they also need to know that we can sustain whatever they support. So we're in this process now, this uh, federally mandated alternatives analysis on Gratiot and on Michigan, and we're moving out of the alternatives analysis on Woodward into the environmental phase. So what, what, to, what do you expect in this process? You start off with the scoping. And you go out and you talk to people and you say, what would you like to see happen on this corridor? What kind of investment do you think we should have? Where do you think stations should go? Just in general, clean slate, what should we do here in terms of rapid transit? They give us some information, we take it, we try to figure out how it fits in with what's possible given the uh, engineering constraints and what's going on on the road, and we come back with what's called a purpose and need document first that says, here's what we heard from you, here's what we believe is important. We, we think that reliability, 24-hour service frequencies, um, safety, all these things are pretty important to you. And as a result of that, we've developed this, what we call universe of alternatives, where we look at mode, which is essentially what vehicle would you use? Is it a light rail vehicle? Is it a bus rapid transit vehicle? Is it an express bus? And then we also look at the alignment. How would you get, how you would tra how you traverse the corridor? Because the corridor, if you define it, is really more than just the specific Woodward, Michigan, and Gratiot. It's kind of the quarter to half mile buffer on each side of that road as well. And so we look at those things and then we, we juxtapose them to population and employment densities to try to figure out where it makes sense to put station stops so we can get the most ridership. And then we have to manage the number of stations that we put in as well because those stations affect your travel time. So we have to be competitive with an automobile in the evaluation of alternatives that we have. It's a very, very technical process to get to this modeling stuff that, gosh, I don't want to do that to you guys right now. <laughs> but in a nutshell, the travel demand forecast model looks at what the average daily traffic is, what the movements are, what the mode share for transit is, and what's the likelihood that you're going to increase ridership based on implementing this service. And FTA wants to know, what am I giving you? What's my cost per new rider? They're backing off of that criteria just a little bit. They want to know a little bit more about economic development as well and what the potential is there. So they're, they're understanding that transit is more than just putting a line in and getting new riders. So we should, we, that's it. I saw you getting a yes on that one. That's a big deal. That's a really big deal because in 2007, we actually had to stop planning on the Michigan Avenue corridor um, because we came up with a series of alternatives that one, weren't necessarily politically feasible. Um, <laughs> that's the right word for it, Larry. Uh, wing. Okay. Uh, wing. Um, and we also had um, an issue where BRT, people really didn't know what it was at the time, so they naturally rejected it. And we were told, hey, this might, be, might not be the time for you. We've got about 200, I don't know what the number was, I think it was about, 200 billion in ads for projects and about half of that available for projects and you're not competitive because you haven't demonstrated ridership in your region and you guys can't agree on exactly what it is you want to do here that makes sense from a cost and new rider perspective. So go back to the drawing board. So I'm sure probably some of you have heard about the Ann Arbor Detroit demonstration project <laughs> attempts that have happened over the past eight years. Wow, it's been eight years yeah. um, since we yeah. since that project was sort of set aside. And I'll tell you, private railroad owners are interesting to negotiate with. They don't have to talk to you. They own it. They've been there before all of this development happened around it. And if you can't make the business case and you can't afford what the access fees are to be on that rail line, you don't get on it. And so this is the momentum that we're hoping to, to, to build here with this regional transit authority and being able to have that funding and being able to say, now we have we can leverage the, this local dollar to get this much more and we have the bargaining power mm -hmm. that we've never had before. And so we're looking at all these things. And so each one of those studies, Gratiot and Michigan, I won't get into the specific details of, of those projects, but that's really what we're looking at as we get into that universe of alternatives. And then once we get past that point, we look at sort of an evaluation matrix. We take you back to the purpose and need that we talked about initially. We say, here are the values you gave us, and here's how all of these 
these alternatives rank up against your criteria. Get a thumbs up for the good stuff, get a thumbs down for the bad stuff. That's about as simple as <laughs> we try, as plain as we try to make it for people to understand what the trade-offs are, so it's a trade-off analysis. And once we've gone out to the community and had conversations with you guys about what those trade-offs are, we come to consensus on a locally preferred alternative. So that was the process that was followed on Woodward, and that's the same process that will follow on Michigan and Gratiot. So I don't know how much time I have left, Megan, and I don't want to use up too much of it. Um, well, why don't we? Um, 